Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to this meeting of the Boston Art Commission. My name is Alexandra Paul Zotop, and I'm the Public Art Registrar for the Mayor's Office of Art and Culture. In that capacity, I'm also the Administrator of the Boston Art Commission. Let's take a moment to update our names and pronouns, as well as to make sure we are all muted. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually. As a reminder, this was extended until 2025. To ensure public access to the deliberations of the Art Commission, the public can join this meeting through telephone and video conferencing. For those of you with us today, this meeting is being recorded and closed captioning is available. You can access it at the bottom of the screen. If you're having trouble locating the button, please chat us for assistance. Thank you, Paul, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, we're really always very happy when you can join us for our meetings and really excited um, to be with you today. Um, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture and the Boston Art Commission believe that public art is any artwork installed in publicly accessible spaces where they can be experienced by everyone for free. For transparency and community input, artworks proposed for City of Boston property are reviewed and discussed at the public meetings of the Boston Art Commission or BAC on a regular and usually monthly basis. Working together with the public art team in the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, the BAC is an independent board composed of two ex officio and seven volunteer community members appointed by the mayor. The BAC has exclusive authority to approve and commission artworks intended to be added to the city's collection or placed on city property. MOAC has a dedicated public art team that facilitates the Boston Art Commission public meetings and manages all phases, daily operations and duties related to public art projects cited on or proposed for City of Boston property in collaboration with the Boston Art Commission, community members and colleagues at the City of Boston. Helping to facilitate this meeting are Amber Torres, Public Art Project Manager, Alexander Paul Zotov, Public Art Registrar and Liza Quinones, Mural Consultant. And we'll add contact information for us in the chat. Um, and you can write us at BAC at Boston.gov. And with that, I will hand it back over to Chair Andres. Did we lose John? Let's give him one second. Uh -oh. It looks like his computer just restarted. Um, he is the chair. So if y'all don't mind, we're just going to give him a moment to get back on. Apologies for that, everyone. My computer just decided to restart right at that moment. No worries. We're ready. OK, great. Welcome, everyone. I call this public hearing to order at 4.37 PM. Today, the commission is holding its monthly public meeting. Our meetings are generally held on the second Tuesday of every month. 
We hope you'll continue to join us. We engage in discussions about public art in Boston in order to foster the creation and collection of artworks that reflect the people, ideas, histories, and futures of Boston, which is located on the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts people and the neighboring Wampanoag and Nipmuc people. We acknowledge the atrocities committed against indigenous peoples, all of the communities that have been subsequently harmed, and the ways in which colonialism has created systemic oppression. We recognize the continuing presence of these communities and the indigenous peoples represented in the city's residents, in addition to those in the diaspora. We also recognize that Boston exists as a result of the forced labor and economic extraction from enslaved African Americans. I'll now take a roll call of commissioners to confirm a quorum. After I state your name, commissioners, please stay here. I'll begin. Vice Chair Camilo Alvarez is not here today. I do know that. Cara Elliott Ortega. Diana Fernandez Bibo. Present. Uh, I don't believe Bob Freeman, are you here? Brian Hone. Here. Nigel Jacob. Present. James Mason. Here. Great. And Abigail Norman will be joining us next month. So we have a quorum. Thanks so very much. On this slide, you'll see today's agenda, which is also posted publicly on the city's website, boston.gov. Now commissioners will review meeting minutes from the, I guess, February meeting. Are there any comments or modifications any commissioners would like to make? Hearing none, I hope a commissioner would call for a motion to accept the minutes from the February meeting. I'll make a motion to accept the February 12th minutes. Thanks, Brian. Do I have a second? Seconded. Thanks so much. I'll now call your name. Um, the motion is to accept the minutes. If you agree, say yes. Diana? Hello, can you hear me, John? Yes. Diana? Yes. Present. Great. Brian? Yes. Nigel? Yes. And James? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the motion passes. I'll now pass to Karen Goodfellow, who'll highlight the presentations for public review and give her director's report. Thank you, John. Um, we have five presentations for review tonight. Fields Corner Road Mural, a street mural, a long-term asphalt mural, for preliminary design review to be cited at the intersection of Dorchester Avenue and Adam Street in Dorchester by the artists Liz LaManche, uh, Nyok Tran Wu with consulting from Rixi Fernandez. And um, it will be presented by the proponent, uh, Jackie West Devine of Fields Corner Main Street. We also have an interior graphics proposal, uh, which would be a long-term mural for final design review to be cited at the Josiah Quincy Upper School in Chinatown by HMFH Architects by the proponent, um, the Public Facilities Department of the City of Boston. We also have um, three long-term um, murals in, in process to present today. Um, the first is X Legacy, a long-term asphalt mural for final design review to be cited at the Malcolm X Park Basketball Court in Roxbury by the artist Otra Ciudad and Nomada Estudio Urbano by the proponent um, Liza Quinones of the City of Boston. Anything Under the Stars, a long-term asphalt mural for final design review to be cited at the Malcolm X Park Basketball Courts in Roxbury by the artist Sydney G. G. James with Gina Latham, um, Eugenia Cortez, Nad Harvin, Seiji Angelina, Sharina Travieso by the proponent Liza Quinones of the City of Boston. And finally, give them their flowers, a long-term asphalt mural for final design review to be cited at the Malcolm X Park Basketball Court in Roxbury by the artist Rob Problack Gibbs um, and presented again by proponent Liza Quinones of the City of Boston. Um, I believe uh, Rob is also working with other artists uh, in collaboration. Apologies for not including them. Lee Soames Beard, um, Dean Five, um, Ricardo Gomez, uh, Michael Talbot, Ayanna Mack, and Luis Urena. 
For updates on existing commissions, uh, Project Manager Amber Torres has been in conversation with David Hinton at the Vine Street BCYF, um, Taylor Campbell from Art and Visual, and Destiny Palmer as we gear up to have Destiny's vinyl mural finally installed this summer. We are working to procure a contractor to prepare the walls, determine the installation timeline, and plan a celebration for the artwork once it's done. We have decided to work with SGH to develop an evergreen rotating sculpture foundation at City Hall Plaza, which may cause delays on the installation of Riavedro sculpture. We will be connecting with a new project manager in property management to expedite the procurement and fabrication of the foundation so that RIA can install by spring. We're also making plans in the event that the artwork is completed before the site is ready if it needs to be stored. Jenny Sabin is in the process of proposing an updated proposal for public art on Ruggles Street in Roxbury that now includes several small installations spread along the corridor instead of two sites originally proposed. We are working with BTD and local abutters to obtain site approvals for the new sites. We anticipate Jenny will come to the BAC for preliminary design review soon. Due to schedule a schedule conflict um, on behalf of the artist Priscilla de Carvalho for the Adam Street Library in Dorchester, the March 6th event has been postponed. Project manager Amber Torres is working with cultural planning project manager Anita Morrison Matra to identify key stakeholders in the area to develop a new engagement strategy to get community input on the preliminary design before bringing it to the BAC. Um, with more commissioning projects, Engine 17 in Dorchester, Michelle Gutlove is working uh, to submit required documentation such as insurance and more, and we look forward to beginning work with her soon. Um, she's a glass artist who's going to be working at a fire station. Um, and with the existing collection, the House Doctor RFP has been re-released and it will close on Thursday, March 28th. Uh, conservation for the 16 by 30 foot painting Webster's reply to Hain by George P.A. Healy will begin next week. The considerable damage to the canvas in the upper left and right corners uh, called for emergency conservation, which is being led by Gianfranco Pocobene, um, who I think is recently retired as Chief Paintings and Research Conservator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And the restoration of Rise by Fern Cunningham continues, led by Daedalus in collaboration with the Department of Transportation. And we are very excited that that is scheduled to be reinstalled in April. And now I will pass uh, back to you, John. Thanks, Karen. Our goal in this meeting is to make a good experience for all. Please remember to keep your comments on topic, brief, and respectful of others. You can submit longer written testimony to BAC at boston.gov. If you're called on, please state your name, title, program, and organization if relevant. Wait, am I missing a slide? The first presentation for review today is the preliminary design review of a long-term asphalt mural by Nyakchon Vu with consulting from Rixi Fernandez and Liz LaManche of Neighborways at the intersection of Dorchester Ave and Adam Street in Dorchester, proposed by Jackie West Devine, Fields Corner Main Street, Public Art Project Manager Amber Torres will introduce this project. Thank you, John. Moak connected with Jackie West Devine from Fields Corner Main Street, summer of 2023, regarding her proposal to create an asphalt mural with a beautification grant from the Small Business Office. Up until now, asphalt murals had usually been approved in the city of Boston on slow streets, not heavily trafficked intersections like Dorchester Ave and Adams Street. Jackie submitted a public art and design application in November, but needed site approval before we could review the rest of her proposal. Jackie had already gone through several rounds of revisions with the transportation department when MOAC stepped in to take a more active role in the site approval in order to establish a precedent for community proposed asphalt murals on heavily trafficked intersections. The design under review tonight has been approved by the BTD, by the transportation department. Thermoplastic murals are technically long-term, lasting longer than standard asphalt murals, which are considered short term. So Jackie will be back to soon present the final design. I am excited for the possibility of seeing this mural in Fields Corner. So I will pass it off to Jackie now to present her preliminary design. Jackie. Thank you so much, Amber. And thank you everybody. Um, my name is Jackie West Devine and I am so happy to um, have you listening and hearing about our presentation this afternoon. I serve as the director of Fields Corner Main Street, and I've been in this position for about four years, and I'm so thrilled to see so many friendly faces on the Zoom today. 
I'm here asking for approval of the, from the Boston Arts Commission for the installation of this permanent asphalt mural in Fields Corner. As you can see, we have a lot of ground to cover and I'm gonna do my best to review the slides with you thoroughly while keeping an eye on the clock. Many of you probably um, know that there are 20 Main Street organizations in Boston, but it might be interesting for you to know that we're actually part of a network of over 1200 Main Streets across the United States. I'm very proud to be part of the Main Street community, which is made up of people in Boston and around the country who utilize hyper-local leaders on our board of directors to serve residents and employees. Uh, through our four pillar approach, we hope we'll attract visitors to our neighborhood our ultimate belief is that a strong small business community is at the crux of a small, strong neighborhood and that if people can have uh, their needs met and walking distance from their homes, they will ultimately live happier lives. We love this picture that the Boston Globe published a couple of years ago. It really um, highlights some of the challenges that we deal with in this intersection. If you look closely, you can see that both lights are red here. There are two cars in the intersection, but if you know this intersection, you know that this picture was probably taken on a Saturday morning and not a Tuesday afternoon because there would be at least five cars stuck in the intersection in constant gridlock. Um, On the next slide, thank you. And um, so part of our call is that there's actually two schools on either side of this intersection. There's a middle school just to the west and, um, excuse me, a middle school just to the east and a high school just to the west. And we deserve, we believe that our teens deserve to commute safely. Um, Fields Corner is actually one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the whole entire United States. We have elders, young families, cognitively disabled folks who get services met in Fields Corner on top of all spectrums of ethnic and economic strata who all call Fields Corner their home. We believe in the power of art, but more than that, we believe in the power of teamwork. And right now, we have a board of directors who cares about this project. We have city departments who have been so friendly in helping us create the guidelines of what uh, populating a space like this can be, um, financial support, and fabulous artists who see the power of this project and are working dedicated, uh, have dedicated so much of their time and talents um, to making this project beautiful. But even more compelling than all of that is that this project is actually designed from the community. Uh, a few years ago on the first Open Streets um, Festival, we uh, put out a call to residents to ask them for input on what they would like us to do. What would they like the future of Fields Corner to be? And this is the data that they provided. So when we got the opportunity to have this kind of funding come in, we knew that we had to answer some of these calls. And as you can see from the chart, the asphalt mural actually addresses two or three, if you count concrete <laughs> flowers as flowers um, to, of their goals. On our project timeline, you can see that we've invested a lot of time getting buy-in and asking for feedback because this project is for the community, we wanted, we wanted to do our best to scaffold our outreach approach. Um, what we found in that is that it's not always appropriate to ask every question of every group that we work with. Uh, we have found that it's more important to have clarity around who cares about what aspect and how, and then go on to create meaningful conversations um, based off of how we can meet the needs of those stakeholders. Um, it, one example is early on in our design process, we had preliminary designs shown at our annual meeting. And we got a lot of negative feedback. People didn't really like those first designs. And so what we did was go back to the drawing board, pull up other pictures of art and murals and found subjects and color stories that were attractive to people. And from there, we were able to relay uh, that to back to the artists and have since brought it forward to um, Tran, Rixie and Liz.
Our coalition is made of 33 smart and dedicated individuals who have put in the time and thought and shared their expertise to give the project a real backbone. Um, believe it when I say that many of these people have clocked hours of their lives explaining the ins and outs of thermoplastic, what perspective hangups might be, and imagining best case scenarios for this project. And the artist selection process, it was really important to our board and our coalition that we hire local artists um, who are fluent in the way that people use the intersection and could see themselves using and enjoying the intersection in the future. The only exception is Miss Liz LaManche because Liz is the foremost um, professional in overseeing asphalt murals uh, uh, in all of New England. Liz has the most experience. And when we were talking to our community, our cohorts, um, excuse me, our coalition members, Liz's name came up time and time again. And we're so happy that she's working with us. And here's the design. The thing that we like about it um, is that it shares uh, some happiness. It is a reflection of folk art without a commitment to being of, uh, of many folk art traditions. It doesn't have a commitment to a specific folk art, um, uh, ethnic background, or have a country of origin. We like that the nods to the flowers were exactly what our community asked for, but and um, and the flowers and the bamboo. Um, but we also liked that the geometric elements add a, a touch of modern modernity, and that speak to both fun and the simplicity of enjoying <laughs> the space that you cross the street. And um, the material is thermoplastic, a name you've probably heard more times today than you maybe ever have. Um, it is a material that you interact with every day because it's what crosswalks are made out of. Um, it's incredibly durable. And um, as you can see in the top right corner, it comes in a variety of colors. Uh, when the best part of this material though, when we were looking at the different options um, for creating art on the street is that it cures immediately. For example, paint takes about six hours to cure. Asphalt cures within minutes, meaning that cars can drive over it as soon as the road is opened again. Um, and while the shelf life of uh, the expected shelf life of thermoplastic is five to seven years, our crosswalks and fields corner were done 10 years ago and they're still completely visible. Our budget is pretty straightforward. Um, we have a reserve of about $5,000, I'll note, for each year uh, to save money. We feel that we'll be able to fund our fundraising will surpass that, given that we've raised $100,000 for this project in the past year. And the research, if you yourself were to look into asphalt murals, um, you wouldn't find that much because this is a new field. Um, but what when you do see research, what you, you see is that there's an uptick in safetyness and an um, individual experience. So people report that they're happier, they're more satisfied when they're crossing the streets. Um, but it's only been done in a handful of municipalities. But we actually think this is a really positive element because what it means is that Boston will be a leader when we have this in this intersection. Um, it's been done enough times that it's been tested. We know that it's it's a value add, but it hasn't been done so much that it feels like we're jumping on someone else's bandwagon. And in conclusion, we believe that the residents, business owners, employees, and visitors of Fields Corner really deserve to cross safely and clearly mark the zones and experience beauty and joy while they do it. Thank you so much for hearing our presentation. I want to stress to you today that this project is about celebrating community. And so when it's installed, we hope you come to Fields Corner and party with us. <laughs> uh, the last few slides are just close-ups of our asphalt design. So you can see a perspective. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Jackie. Um, before we begin with commissioner question and comments, I'm curious if any of the proponents or artists from this project would like to say anything about their work. Tron, I see you're here. You don't have to share anything. I was just curious if you wanted to. Totally fine if not. I now open it up to commissioner questions and comments. Uh, Jackie, I would just say congratulations. It seems like a really rich community process, kind of getting from your first ideas to where you are today. It's uh, fun to see that kind of process. Um, and the design is exciting and bright and um, I think will hopefully resonate with your communities. Um, I'm wondering, you know, I think one of the goals is kind of safety, right? Um, just because I'm curious, it has there, I'm sure you've done some work with the transportation department to think about you know, like overall, you know, safety improvements, things like like timing of street lights or you know that kind of thing, and how that will relate to maybe some of the safety features of the mural itself. Any ideas there? Absolutely. So um, the project is, while we think it's a lot, it brings a lot to the table. It's not going to solve all the safety problems, and we don't anticipate that that that's its job really. Um, but what it has done is create um, incentive to do this. And so we are looking at retiming um, the, the crosswalk, the, the lights. We're also looking at where the stop lines are for where the car stop. Uh, if you're familiar with the intersection, there's one street that goes down Leonard. Uh, Leonard Street is off of Adam Street, and it, that's the start of some headaches. And there's two, two or there's three parking lots that come off of the intersection as well. And so we're taking a look at where smarter stop lines could be for cars, so that cars can move more clearly um, and in a way that would prevent gridlock. We're also going to be coming up with the um, transportation plans for when school starts and ends uh, because the needs of teachers are actually to get in quickly <laughs> and we want cars to be moving quickly when teachers are, are entering and exiting and very slowly or more slowly when students are entering and exiting. Got it. Sounds like all exciting and complicated work, <laughs> but um, just congratulations again on your presentation on the project. Thank you. Anybody? Any other questions? I had a question, Jackie. Um, we at the Boston Art Commission can review the mural design and uh, vote to approve that, but I was curious what other city permissions are required for the mural and what other departments you've spoken with and if they too are supportive of this project. Um, great question. Um, so next on our list is going to be the variety of permits. Um, we have a good relationship with C11, our local police department. Um, I'm sure we're going to need to close down the street, of course, when this happens. Um, we're also talking to the schools and making sure that they're engaged and they can celebrate with us when the um, when the asphalt mural is installed. Um, and, you know, whatever happens at 1010 will happen at 1010 and we'll face the music. <laughs> but that's the next step. That's tomorrow's problem. <laughs> Um, so the that there there are some things that are unknown, um, but we anticipate that we've gotten through the hardest parts. Thanks, Jackie. Any other commissioner questions or comments? If I could just add, I meet regularly with uh, the Public Improvement Commission, um, and I have contacts there, so I'm going to be um, available for Jackie in case anything comes up or any concerns with permits. Thanks, Amber. And, and I'll add to that, Amber, in that meeting is always also meeting with the Disabilities Commission and with any street murals or, or works on sidewalk. We um, get a lot of input from them and they're always really helpful in making sure that we're working with artists and community members to design um, to be inclusive and not to create anything distracting or confusing for any pedestrians. 
Thank you. And that was part of the approval of this design was that it wasn't instructive to pedestrians or cars um, or even bicycles in any way. That was a big concern of, of, of for transportation. And again, the asphalt mural material is very thin. It's the same material as crosswalk, so it shouldn't have any height or vibration issues. Great, any other commissioner comments or questions? I just, I just had a, a very quick question about um, right, the tra the transparency of the process. I'm, I'm wondering, was is this process sort of spelled out or is it something that you had to, is it something in Liz's head or you know, I'm, I'm wondering if I wanted to do one, would I have to re rediscover your process and trying to figure this out for my neighbor? I'm just wondering in general, but the transparency of uh, other folks having to do this. I know that you 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 went through a lot of work in getting this done. Yeah, I um, Amber and I have talked a lot about how, what process building could be like in this respect because we understand that some of the pushback and some of the hoops that we've had to jump through actually have to do with the fact that this is something that's brand new and mm. could be huge for the city of Boston. So there's a lot of documentation. And as far oh, as... Cool. Um, other documentation we reached out to you know the dorchester reporter mm. uh, and social oh, media wow. newsletters and then uh tried to spread it through natural networks of like people who would be in the know who are who are local um but yeah if you know anybody else who's interested in this kind of project please share my information because I feel like it's such a joy to talk about this stuff. I I feel so lucky um, to talk about bringing art to our city. And um, so I, I would love it if there was more of it. We, we anticipate and we hope we're role models. Awesome. I just have a, probably a silly question, but um, with all of the lines on, on the road with the crosswalk and traffic lines, the design, A, are there any reflective properties to it and how does it align with those lines on the road? Do you mean the um, the grid that was there previously? What's there now maybe in the future to guide traffic? Oh, I see. Well, in the middle of the intersection, James, there's no lines. Um, so there's no, there's no traffic lines. There's the double line on Dorchester Ave and a single line on Adams street, but the part, uh, the space where our mural occupies, there are no traffic lines, um, because cars can cross a variety of ways, uh, some right angles and some straight lines through. Um, and it was, you would think we actually had that question about whether or not we should have art that's instructive in some way, and could that be helpful, but streets didn't want anything to do with that. The, mm -hmm. um, the crosswalks will be repainted before the murals installed as well, we, we hope, we anticipate. If you could pull up a picture of the mural again, so that way we can refer. Did I answer your question all the way, James? You did, you did. Okay. Well, I'll add, um, Streets is generally pretty clear with us that any, we shouldn't try to be creating anything that is signaling to pedestrians or drivers because those those colors and patterns need to be really consistent and recognizable. So if anything, um, we are instructed to stay stay away from that. And that was more of my question as well. So thanks for clarifying. I'd now like to open it up to the public. If anyone has a question or comment, please feel free to raise your hand. Go ahead, Abby. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you for having me and the public here. Uh, my name is Abby Jamiel. And my professional title is that I am the director of the Emerald Network for Livable Streets Alliance. Um, I'm also a previous resident of the Clam Point neighborhood. So I'm kind of wearing both a professional and personal hat sort of in the in the room today. But um, with my professional hat back on, um, the 
Livable Streets Alliance, our whole goal is to serve as a transportation advocacy nonprofit here in Boston. And we advocate for safer streets for people who walk, who ride, who scoot, who stroll, all that. And then the, prog the program that I lead with the Emerald Network is a vision for over 250 miles of greenways in the city. So just to kind of name where I'm coming from. So firstly, we support this project because public art is awesome <laughs> and we love it. And we think that it complements a lot more permanent installations that are showing up in Fields Corner and like definitely plus one all around. Secondly, with the safety perspective, this particular intersection is part of Boston's um, high crash bicycle network. And without the clear delineation of these multimodal lanes, it can be really dangerous. And the, while charming, but very particular geometry of this particular intersection definitely also makes it quite roundabout for pedestrians. That leads to jump, jumping and signal crossings and just makes it generally unsafe. And finally, we, we know that this type of intervention works. Um, Bloomberg Asphalt Art Study from 2020 noted that street-based art murals decrease the rate of crashes by 50% when it comes to pedestrians and other vulnerable road users, and that it that they decrease by 38% pedestrians crossing against a walk signal. So we're all for this here at Louisville Streets. And then finally, we just want to elevate that this intervention actually goes beyond just this one particular okay. intervention. Um, this is a really critical location throughout the fabric of Dorchester, not only for the businesses in Fields Corner, uh, but we're actually working at Livable Streets to potentially see if we can create a greenway on a tunnel cap that runs from Shawmut Station to Ashmont called the Dorchester Greenway. And so this intersection would be a really critical link between that potential green space and the Harbor Walk and getting to the Neponset. So we support this project. Just want to say thank you for having us here. And um, Jackie has been a really great community partner for us. So we'd love to see it move, move forward. Abby, thanks for sharing all of that data and for the possible and potential plans for the future. That's really helpful. Thanks, Abby. Any other public comments? Seeing none, I'm wondering if a commissioner could make a motion. And I'd like to clarify, um, Amber or Karen, is this preliminary design? Yes. Okay, so we'll come back one more time. Mm -hmm. Would any commissioner like to make a motion approving the preliminary design of this mural? I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead, Diana. I'd like to make a motion to approve this project for preliminary design. Do I have a second? Yes, I will second. Thanks, James. I'll now call all of your names. If you agree with the motion, please say yes. Diana? Yes. Brian? Yes. Nigel? Sorry, I was muted. Yes. Oh, thanks, Nigel. James? Yes. And I'm a yes as well, so the motion passes. Congratulations, Jackie, to all of the artists, Liz, Tran, Rixi. Um, I look forward to seeing this again to for final design, but for now, congratulations. The next presentation for today is the final design review for the interior graphics in Josiah Quincy Upper School. I'll pass to Liza. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, commissioners and everyone. Um, I was first introduced to the interior artwork scope at the Josiah Quincy Upper School when newly appointed as mural consultant last spring, 2023. While we originally intended for this artwork scope to be included with the recently launched BPS wide mural initiative, A Canvas of Culture, we were not able to due to the timeline scheduling and production needs of the project. Due to timeline constraints, this proposal is requesting artist selection, preliminary design, and final design review. 
The following artwork consists of two large scale 2D murals fabricated on acoustic panels and three interior graphics and are the creations of the architects in-house graphic designer, Colin Drydock. Here to present the work are the architects. Uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you for allowing us to give this brief presentation about the uh, artwork that HMFH Architects uh, has done as an integral part of our design for the new Quincy Upper School in Chinatown. Um, I'm Pip Lewis, the project director uh, for the project for HMFH Architects. And also here is Colin Dockrell, the, um, uh, who is our graphic designer. Now, uh, the Quincy Upper School is the only open enrollment um, public school in Massachusetts that offers the International Baccalaureate Program, or IB, to all of its students. Uh, IB is a global education network uh, that seeks to develop inquiring, caring students who direct their own learning pathways as they move up through their K-12 education. And IB uh, provides a series of, um, of learner profiles to students, uh, which is, a, is important words or ideas that help to define the character of a successful student. The community has been working with us to ensure that the graphics developed for the project reinforce the IB program identity for the school. So these learner profile words and the idea of students' pathways ascending upward through the building um, as their education uh, moves along have provided us with the inspiration and the structure for a lot of the, the artwork for the school. Um, the school, as you see here, is vertically oriented because it was uh, built on a, a very small site for a school with over no with eight levels of um, of space. On the lower levels are the public facing spaces, uh, uh, auditoriums and uh, gymnasium and uh, things like that, and classrooms are on the upper floors. Uh, the oldest students are located at the very top of the school. So the students actually do ascend up through the building uh, as they uh, pursue their individual educational paths. Um, next slide, please. Um, over the last several months, um, we have been working with the, um, with the school community uh, to develop the artwork that you'll see here. And as you, um, as is shown, uh, we met with the headmasters, we met with the school site council, and with a smaller work group to develop the final images that you, we will show you. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, maintenance, the, the, uh, the actual maintenance uh, recommendations for the for the material um, will be presented um, fr from through the contractor. Uh, as a part of their closeout documents when they submit operation and maintenance manuals for us a little bit later in, in this year. Uh, but I can tell you that the material is a stretch uh, vinyl um, fabric that uh, is sometimes mounted on acoustic uh, insulation. Uh, and it has a class A fire rating, is hydrophobic so that it repels water and will come with a, a 10 year uh, warranty. So maintenance, we're anticipating being very uh, minimal on the project. Um, now, Colin will walk you through the uh, comprehensive design for the school uh, graphics. Thank you. Thanks, Pip. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start at the ground floor front entrance, and we'll work our way up through the building. And there are five specific locations that we'll talk about. So you can see where the arrow is on the plan, that little zigzag line is in the media center where the first acoustic panels are. And then we'll move on to the second dash line, which is 22 feet above the cafeteria um, on the second level. So next slide, please. The acoustic panels in the cafeteria are composed of a typographic collage that um, in contains all the, the 10 definitions that um, are part of the school's mission statement. And the kids are striving towards these through their entire school career when they're when they're there at JQUS. 
Uh, it's um, also red, which is the school color, and all of the murals work within this system that, that pulls us up through the building. So next slide, please. Yeah, it's, um, it's about 35 feet long, made up of panels. Uh, it's approximately five feet high and really is meant to just remind the kids, um, rather than just being read, which it could have been using a, a teaching moment within a library to remind the kids what the the pieces that they're constantly reminded of through the school. All of these definitions are printed out everywhere. They're in all the classrooms. They're broken down. So they're really familiar with them. And this just kind of underscores that when they're in the media center. So next slide. In the cafeteria, this is the main piece. It's approximately 30 feet wide and 40 feet tall. It's comprised of six panels uh, printed on acoustic fabric. And uh, it has a phoenix and a dragon flying in the clouds over the city of Boston. Next, please. So the phoenix is the um, mascot of JQS Quincy Upper School. And so we, they really wanted that specifically incorporated, particularly with the colors and within the design of the whole the whole process. Next, please. Across the street is the Quincy Elementary School. Their mascot's a dragon, and they they sit across from each other. And so the mural, the, the components there, the two characters in the mural sit across each other. This the new building creates a gateway, almost a campus, and you can imagine the um, dragon passing the metaphorical pearls of knowledge across the street with, they have the IB logo embedded in them, to the kids as they rise up, you know, continuing their education. Next, please. Here's a view from the ground floor of how it would look. You'll be able to see this particularly at night from the street, maybe even from the turnpike if you're, um, it's not too busy and you're paying attention, not paying attention to the road. Um, and you'll see it's a double height space where the kids will be eating. Upstairs on the second floor, you go up there to go to the black box theater, the auditorium and the gymnasium. And you'll see the gymnasium through those doors, through the glass surround and we'll move in there next where the gym is, you know, one of the hearts of the spirit of the school. And so to demonstrate that and emphasize it, if you go to the next slide, please. We went through a, a group community process and they really loved the idea of the Phoenix flying across the um, across the gym that way. And the the JQS letters rising out of the flames to really instill the, the school spirit. And these two are, um, these are vinyl uh, versus acoustic panel. These are vinyl on the wall. And they would be in the image here, they're looking a little white against the white. They actually, the white background matches the white paint. So it, it would just look like the colored tag, the colored image on the wall. And next. So here in this section of the building, you can kind of see how the colorway works through the building from the red down on the bottom floor up to the second floor with the larger mural that actually contains all the colors of the entire building for the kids, you know, in the shared spaces, they, you can imagine that's a relationship that they can all have. Uh, up between the third and fourth floor and the fifth and sixth floor, there are two connecting light wells. And um, you can see those two on the right-hand side. <clears throat> These again are also vinyl murals, vinyl applied murals. And if you could click the next slide, please. So in the middle, the middle years mural that goes between the third and fourth floor, all the um, all the components, the study components that the kids have as part of their process are um, included on the, you know, metaphorically on the bird, making up the bird, the wings that are helping them rise up through their educational process. And so these are there that, you know, the repeating the mascot and then repeating all the components that they're all really familiar with at this point. Next. 
on the, you can see on the left-hand side, it's, it's located in a glassed off light well. And this is a breakout project area in the center, the heart really between the two, um, between the two floors. There's one on each floor. So each floor can see this component there. Next, please. And then on the upper floor, repeating the same mascot uh, with the school color and then changing it a little bit to enforce that there's the diploma program, which is really the pinnacle of the student's education once they reach the, the top floor in their highest grades. And next, please. And so here's this, a similar view as the one downstairs, same, same layout. The skylight above lets the sunlight down on this through into the two project areas that are stacked above one another. And that's the totality of our um, presentation. So I'm really glad you got to see it. Thanks, Pip. Thanks, Colin. I'd now open it up to commissioner questions and comments. I have one question considering we're going from artist selection, preliminary design and final design, sort of all in this one review. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit more about the involvement of the community and feedback you may have received and what that process was like? Pip, do you want to? Uh, yeah, so the uh, the uh, for the most part, in terms of these internal graphics, the community that we work with is the school community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's also a, a broader Chinatown and South End community. Um, and um, we, uh, it's sort of an integral part of the, the design of the, the, the project has been sort of members of the, of the school, the headmasters and other, other people. And um, we particularly once uh, it was established that we were, because of timing, that this had to be done in-house. This is something that we typically do uh, in-house for, for all of our schools. Um, but um, there was a desire for the, um, uh, uh, for the, the city of Boston to, to uh, do it as a public sort of call for, for arts. When it was determined that that wasn't gonna happen, we met with the, with the headmasters to um, first uh, uh, give some just general ideas about where the art was and what it might reflect. Uh, particularly a strong comments that we got. Uh, and, and then we met with the, uh, the school uh, site council um, and we, we got comments that some of the initial proposals that we had didn't really reflect the IB program in, in, in a clear way. And they really wanted us to uh, drive down on the fact that they're very proud of the fact that they are indeed an IB program. Um, and so th that uh, led us in the direction of combining uh, the idea of the, the dragon from the elementary school and the phoenix from the, uh, from the, the upper school um, as sort of uh, becoming this continuum of the IB program from the, their elementary program to the middle school program to the diploma program and the passing up of the pearls of knowledge and also the incorporation of these um, of, the, of these special words that get repeated throughout the, the IB program, um, sort of incorporating them in with the design of, of the, the Phoenix and, and things like that. And we thought it was interesting that the, the um, the, the the mascot was a phoenix, which is rising from the ashes, and the idea of the uh, of of each student's individual path sort of rising as you go through uh, their education. Uh, and then there was a smaller work group, uh, smaller than the um, than the school site council, um, that allowed us to sort of uh, uh, show the pro progress of the designs and, and finally get to this. Um, uh, approved design that we that you see here. Thanks, Pip. Um, just one clarifying question before I move on to other commissioners. Who is on the site council? So I, I don't know if the if headmaster Richard Chang is here. Um, um, hi, Pip. This is uh, Ron McNulty from okay. the Public okay. Police Department. I believe Daphne is um, here from BPS. She might be able to speak to that more specifically. <laughs> Thank you. I'm 
I'm just, I'm only curious who is on that site council. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I don't want to speak if Daphne can't get on or. Um, Hello, hold, hold okay, on one second. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, you, Daphne, you've gone back onto mute. Hello, sorry. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, I was multitasking in another <laughs> meeting. Um, let me, does my camera need to be on for this meeting? Uh, no, you can just feel free to share without the camera being okay. on. Okay. And we Thank were just so looking for who, uh, uh, more information about who, who participated with the site council. I mean, the school site council. Awesome. So uh, for us, um, just for record, my name is Stephanie Germain. I work as the senior project manager for the Boston Public Schools Capital Planning Division um, in partnership with HMFH. Uh, as the graphics were being generated, uh, we introduced it to our, the, um, through the district's racial equity planning tool, we introduced the graphics to the school site council which is composed of staff, uh, parents, uh, stakeholders, and they meet on a monthly basis. As the graphics were presented, we shared with them the initial graphics um, and received a lot of good feedback from uh, the, that community engagement process. And the slides were then shared with staff and students. From the information that we collected, um, we shared it with HMFH and they made some adaptions. And then we convened again a group of school leaders as well as um, internal leaders within BPS uh, who reviewed the followed up, followed up following graphics. And then the final presentation was done um, to uh, the school site council um, for the final graphics uh, and received uh, some very, very positive feedback from the community as well as our uh, district leadership um, that one, the feedback from our community members were taken into account uh, that uh, the IB profile was something that they really wanted to promote and brand within the graphics, as well as a level of respect that was paid um, to the community in terms of how, especially within the cafeteria <laughs> graphic of the Phoenix and the Dragon, uh, that the community felt um, honored um, and how they were displayed and that it was done in a way that um, it would inspire the students as well. So we're very grateful for the opportunity to partner with HMFH to present and collect the feedback. Thanks, Stephanie. That's helpful. Any other commissioner questions or comments? I think I just had you know, maybe a similar question, but like, you know, school is ultimately made up of students and just, you know, wanting to make sure that there is student voice. I think I kind of heard that, um, but maybe just kind of doubling down on that student perspective, um, if there's anything more that you'd like to share. Otherwise, you know, I, I think I heard that student voice was kind of mm -hmm. as a part of that process. Yes, student voices was part of the process we had of the, uh, Quincy's, I'm sorry, JQ US's uh, arts teacher was part of the group and also brought back the graphics to the students and they had their own conversations in terms and they collected feedback. Uh, part of the district's racial equity planning tool ensures that we are always honoring um, the voices of all of the key uh, stakeholders in the work that we're doing and for the new build of JQUS student voice, especially as this will be something that they see every day, um, that they themselves felt inspired by it and they felt that they feel that it was something that represented them. Cool. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? I now open up to any members of the public that might want to make a comment or have a question. Okay, hearing none, um, I have one more question and that is that 
was the selection process for this, this was done by the architects in-house, the graphic designer of the HMFH architecture firm, is that correct? Uh, that's the, um, this is a process that we do on all of our school uh, that we've been doing over recent years using uh, uh, Colin Dockrell as our graphic designer. So okay. the selection process was the city and the MSBA, this, this mass school building authority selecting HMFH to design the new um, uh, uh, Quincy Upper School back in two, 2011, I think 2012. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the designs are wonderful. I just think that this could be, as you sort of develop more schools, an opportunity to engage uh, different artists, local artists. Um, so I hope as you continue to build design and develop schools that you'll take that into consideration. Um, Colin's work here is great, but I, I, it would be nice to see um, other opportunities for artists here in Boston. That's one of the um, missions that we have here at the BAC. So I hope you'll take that under consideration. And as was, was said, this was because of timing. The, 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 and so I encourage uh, the city of Boston to realize that there are now other schools under construction and in earlier parts of design and to get involved with those schools early on so that it doesn't become a problem with, um, hey, the school's going to open on you know in September, therefore we don't have time to do this. I think this was really just a question of timing. So I think we're I voting I, on. Oh, oh go ahead, Brian. I guess you know on that note, I'm, and I don't. And my goal is not to you know disrupt the process, but um, it seems like the opening of the school, or I guess there's is the goal to have the installation of the murals kind of ready to go by the time that the school opens. I think that's probably the hope, right? Um, but I, you know, I would echo John's um, kind of um, enthusi enthusiasm for moving forward with artists that you know, are from the Boston community and kind of uh, that go through a community process too. Um, and I don't know, Liza, if, if you have anything more to add about the kind of process. Um, I know you, you mentioned that briefly at the beginning. Any context there? Yeah, I mean, I'll just reiterate that it was really just a matter of timing here. And um, because these works needed to be fabricated in a very specific kind of way on the acoustic paneling and, and with the final production, um, the lead time for it just did not allow for us to be able to go through a um, full uh, call and um, engagement and design process as we would with other projects that were able to start from the beginning of the process. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Liza. I do also share in your um, encouragement um, moving forward with um, with all school projects and, and projects in general that we um, give opportunities to um, being able to select a range of diverse artists um, for these projects. I'd also just uh, suggest the involvement of students in the entire process from selection of the artist to preliminary design helps provide a sense of ownership to those people who are attending the school um, and an excitement about the visual arts, public art. And so I hope that in the future you'll consider that. So thanks for that. Uh, now though, we turn to the vote. I guess this is a vote for artist selection and final design. John, for... somebody has their hand up or oh, hat. I'm sorry, yes? Oh, I Actually, I just had a comment, but you literally just took the words out of my mouth, but not even for the future. I was thinking that although the students were involved in the design process, per se, I know they won't be actively in school. But if it's an opportunity to have some students involved throughout the production of the pieces so they can learn, I think that would be pretty dope. That's just my that's just my two cents. But go ahead and vote. <laughs> Thank you for that comment and for sort of reiterating what it is that we try and do here at the BAC. Many thanks for that. 
so now I, I sorry, oh, John, I'm going to ask go another question. But just to that point, um, you know, it seems like these are all these are um, vinyl or kind of fabricated materials. Has that been a consideration of thinking about kind of engaging, you know, students in the in the physical creation of one of these works? So, you know, like physical paint on the wall, or there are numerous mural artists in this call this evening who I'm you know, sure would be excited to see that kind of work happen uh, physically in the space rather than kind of a fabricated product that then is installed in place. I'm curious if that's been a part of the conversation. Well, the um, one of the advantages of doing it this way is theoretically, I, I guess if, if you have the students painting something on the walls, it can be painted over and, and done over again, but this can be uh, 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 peeled off and replaced if need be in the in the, in the the future. Um, I would just point out that this was all, there were no extras involved with this. We The Turner Construction, when they bid the project, they bid doing this um, artwork uh, of, of, for the, for, as, as a part of the, of the project. That's why I say it was a, sort of an integral part of the design. So we didn't, they owned the, the, the creation and installation of these uh, vinyl graphics from the very beginning, even though the actual design wasn't done until after the determination that it wasn't going to move ahead um, through the city uh, um, process. Um, and we were actually wondering if it, if the city takes this on, what sort of a credit are we going to be able to get back from, from the contractor for the work that they're not doing um, and that the city is, is doing? But uh, that became a, a, a moot point. I just wanted to point out, this is all stuff that was all in the construction contract from the beginning. And it, it could be done in a, in a, a different way. This is just the way we uh, did this uh, project. Thank you for context. Brian, I'll, I'll also add, we have another acoustic panel we've done before at the bowling building in the school committee room that was designed by a student um, like 10 years ago, if you're ever over there. Um, yeah, we were, what, we, as we as we started working um, um, with the city to provide the art, the idea was that it would be a computer driven thing that would be printed on vinyl and hand it over to the contractor to, to install. So, yeah, again, so this, sorry, this is Ron McNulty mm -hmm. from the Public mm -hmm. Facilities Department. The other important consideration for this particular area of the building is I think Pip and Colin mentioned at the beginning is the acoustic uh, properties on this particular location. This is a rather tall space. There's a lot of relatively noisy activity. There's the auditorium, there's the gymnasium, the cafeteria. So the backing to this mural, to this um, fabric is, is, is an acoustic material that we felt was very important to the design of the building to make it a more, more habitable space. And this is um, Carrie Griffin, Director of Public Facilities. We're managing the project for um, <clears throat> the city. And so I just want to just highlight, too, that, you know, we typically work, work with arts and culture. And on, you know, the police station in East Boston, we had a call for artists for the Carter School that's coming up. There's an RFP currently out for a call for artists. Um, this did not take the normal process, but I think we ended up with a great result. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks, Pip and Ron, for all of that context as well. Well, with so much conversation, I'm curious if a commissioner would like to make a motion to approve final design for the John Sai Upper School. I can make a motion to approve final design for the Josiah Quincy Upper School murals. Thanks, Brian. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thanks, Diana. I'll now take roll call. If you agree with the motion, please say yes. Diana? Yes. Brian? Yes. Nigel? Yes. James? Yes. And I'm a yes as well.
So congratulations to you all. And I would encourage you on the next um, building construction site, if you could loop arts and culture in earlier and perhaps we could have uh, an RFP for an artist call. Um, I think we'd all greatly appreciate that. But many thanks for your presentation tonight. And oh, good thank luck you. Thank with you the very opening much. of the school. Question. Our third presentation for review today is X Legacy, a long-term asphalt mural in the final design phase by artists Otra Ciudad and Nomada Estudio Urbano for the Malcolm X Park basketball court in Roxbury proposed by Liza Quinones and the city of Boston. And Liza will introduce the project. Thanks again, John. Our call to artists for three long-term basketball court murals at Malcolm X Park in Roxbury was first released in April of 2022 um, in partnership with the Department of Parks and Rec as part of a larger $8.8 million park renovation project. Now, almost two years later, I'm very excited to present the final mural designs for the commission's approval for installation. Starting with court number three, Boston-based team Otra Ciudad and its international partners Nomada Estudio Urbano will present their design developed under thoughtful consideration and engagement with a selected group of community stakeholders, which included family members of Malcolm X, and community members with deep connections to Roxbury and the game of basketball. Some of those members are, whom are present on this call today and may be interested in providing testimony on any of the three courts that we'll be reviewing. I will now introduce Nicholas Orellana of Otra Ciudad to present their work. Thank you, Liza. So, hi everyone, thank you for this opportunity. Wait a sec. So we are Otra Ciudad and Nomada Estudio Urbano. Uh, we are two, two groups that are joining force for this project in here in Boston, the city where, where I live. Uh, as you can see, Sebastian, Miguel, and myself, we are all we all study architecture. And in all the projects that we do, we try to bring this architectural background. Uh, or understanding of the public space, the human scale, and the and the understanding of the power of the art to bring community together. So, in this project, in the next slide, what we are proposing is uh, is called the X Legacy. So, the proposal to choose case a hybrid college between the legacy of Malcolm X and the resiliency and transformative power of Roxbury uh, through patterns, geometries, iconography, and a vibrant color palette. The aim is to create a new urban narrative that promotes the empowerment of the resident. And additionally, the, the graphics of the courts adapt to the lines of the game, ensuring that the artwork does not become interesting during the basketball play. So during this process, uh, we have been getting some feedback from the community, <clears throat> uh, from residents, from the uh, basketball coach, uh, and from the other teams as well, because there are three courts. And from those uh, engagements, uh, we brought some color palettes, uh, which is the one that you can see here. It's a warm color palette that we think that represent the, the values of, of that we learn from the community. And also we want to bring some iconic elements uh, from Malcolm X into the design. <clears throat> so in the next slide, you can see the process that we went through. Uh, those are different compositions that we were exploring during the process. Uh, we create one of them, we send it, to, to share, we share it. Uh, we discuss it with other, with other teams, uh, we get some feedback as well, and then we evolve that, pro that design in a way that we're trying to find a way to balance the colors uh, and also the iconography. Uh, so in the next slide, you can see the final design that we're proposing for the core number three. 
where you can see this color palette, the icons and the, and the graphics, the geometric composition that, it, that is, is abstract, but at the same time, you can see the X letter as like a, an element that's part of the pattern that we represent. Also, you can see that we respect uh, close to the, uh, to the areas where the basketball uh, needs more definition in terms of the lines. We're trying to keep the design calm and focus more in the center where the game is more open. <clears throat> so in the next slide, you can see um, this is the, the location within the context. So we are the, the core number three. Uh, also, from the context, we, we, we know that this uh, basketball court is surrounded by large trees that change the color. Uh, we also wanted to make a design that it can be part of the, of the natural environment. <clears throat> so in the next slide, you can see, uh, you can see a full montage that we did uh, in the court number three. Uh, where the design is, is, is seen from a human perspective. Uh, and you can see, we're trying to vitalize this space with those colors, uh, give it some energy to the, to the place as well. <clears throat> so in the next slide, uh, Liza, uh, you can see this is, those are images from the community engagement during the implementation of murals in previous projects. Uh, we also, we always try to bring, uh, uh, to open and invite the community to participate in the design or in the implementation of the design as well. And in this case, uh, we invite uh, an art teacher from a Greater Eglison High School and they are happy to participate. So they are gonna be part of the, of the implementation of this uh, asphalt project here in Roxbury. <clears throat> so in the, in the next slide, uh, you can see this is the process, how we present it. So it's divided in four steps. First step, it's the cleaning and the prime of the, of the court. So we make sure that we are starting in a, in a clean and flat uh, surface. Then we protect the lines and we implement the, the patterns, this geometric design. <clears throat> in that way, as this is based on geometric shapes, in the step four, we can invite people from community, not necessarily experts in the, in the field of painting. And as they are assigned to a certain areas of the mural, they can paint those flat areas with a single color. <clears throat> this is the process that we have implemented before and we think that it worked fine. In the step four, uh, we finish with, a more, with more technical skills. Uh, the, we do the, fi the, the finished touches of the design to make sure that the final result is uh, aligned with the expectation of, the, of this art project. So yeah, I think this is the end of the presentation. Thanks so much, I really appreciate it. Um, I'd open it up to commissioners for any questions or comments. I have a comment. Um, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, I love the sensitivity to sort of the landscape context and um, also thinking about these cultural references. Um, I, I'm not a basketball player myself, so I just love to sort of ask the question of, you know, how does this, this is beautiful art uh, were there any considerations to how the sport is played um, that, that were taken into account in terms of your overall layout and, and where you'd chose to deploy color? Yeah, sure. That, that's a really good question. And it's always, I think the, the coach, the basketball coach made the same uh, comment when we were in the, in the process. And I think it's, it's, it's really important. So those courts are, are used quite often. So I know they do uh, every Monday night, they have like a little tournament also Sunday. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's pretty well used by people who, who really play basketball, like in a, in a high, in a good level. So in this design, uh, you can see all the patterns and all the geometry is based on the lines of the basketball, the, the regulatory lines of the basketball. So we use those lines as a starting point. 
And then, uh, as you can see in the red areas at the end, those are the areas where usually the, in the game of basketball, they need better definition of the lines. So for those areas, we're trying to keep it calm, just a red flat color, uh, and in that way don't interfere with the, with the game itself. So it's a good question. Actually, we modify a little bit the design based on that, a similar comment that the one that you are making now. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? I now would open up to any members of the public or any other artists who may be here and would like to speak on this project. Hearing none. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say um, I, I really like the court and I was just hoping that a lot of the things that you described when we were talking about like the colors and the process, when there's a, when the signage comes up, could you put some of the things that you described into the signage to describe, you know, the, the courts? Because when people, when, when we come as residents to see it, we're not going to, a lot of people aren't going to hear all of the things that you just, just said to describe, you know, all the things that you incorporated. So I think that when, when, when at the beginning, when, talking, when you made a description of it, if you could incorporate a little bit more of the, the details in that for the people who are going to be there and read the signage, I think that that would help really translate and get the message across. So I just want to throw that in. But other than that, I think it's a great job. Thank you. Thanks so much Thanks for your so comment. I'm curious, Liza, do you know if there's going to be any didactic information about these pieces near those courts? Yes, it's something that we've been talking about um, with parks, um, and we definitely have plans to incorporate signage for each of these works. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Liza. You're welcome. Any other public comments? Yeah, I would, I would add that uh, I think that I want to kind of dovetail on what Smoke said. I, I think that the, the description of the artist, the inspiration of the artist's work or why they approach the work the way that they have um, as they explain it to the community or they give it to the community as a way to help them to understand how the art was integrated is, is brilliant because I think often there's community members that don't necessarily understand um, the perspective of things from an artist's view, but when they can get that description, um, it really helps them to understand and appreciate the art in a, a much more vibrant way. And it, it, the thing that I like most about it is it allows parents to explain the art to children and it, and it really helps to, um, have youth to start to appreciate art more and understand how art is being used to transform public space. Thanks, Gordon. Really appreciate that comment. And I think, as Eliza says, we're working on ways to integrate a lot of that explanatory material um, working with parks so that exactly what you described can happen. So many thanks for your comments. Well, with that, I'm curious if there's a commissioner who would like to approve final design for X Legacy. I'd like to make a motion to approve the design for X uh, Legacy. Do I have a second? Yes, I'll second. Thanks so much, James. Commissioners, I'll state your name. If you agree with the motion, please say yes. Diana? Yes. Brian? Yes. Nigel? Yes. James? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the motion passes. Congratulations. It's a great mural and I'm excited. I think we're all excited to see it installed on the basketball court. Thank you. Our next presentation. Oh, yeah, sure. Our next presentation for review today is Anything Under the Sun, a long-term asphalt mural in the final design phase by Sydney G. James, Lucina Latham, Ijania Cortez, Nod Harvin, Seiji Vangelina, Sharina Trevieso for the Malcolm X Park Basketball Court in Roxbury, proposed by Liza Quinonez, City of Boston. And Liza will again introduce this project.
Hi again, everyone. Moving forward to our next long-term basketball court mural project at Malcolm X Park. I'm excited to present the final design for court number two. This design was developed by Sydney G. James, a Detroit-based artist in her team, which includes emerging and rising women artists representing Boston and other neighborhood neighboring cities. Sydney and her team have actively participated in community engagement sessions alongside the other two court teams, collaborating with a dedicated group of stakeholders deeply devoted to Roxbury, the park and its namesake. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Sydney to present their work. Hello, I would love to present to you anything under the sun. And it's suns plural because as we all know, if you paid attention in science, stars are suns. So the, the idea behind it, it was um, to honor Malcolm X specifically, his legacy, um, the geography of the basketball court and also the history around the area, surrounding the area. Um, can you go to the design, Liza? Oh, this is my cute team. Girls. Can you go to the next slide with the design? Okay. Uh, okay. Here I can go to back to that one. So here's the design. Um, as you can see, it's two figures, nondescript figures, bursting out of the stars. So if you want to go back to the explanation, I will present it to you. Um, this was collectively designed. The next slide. I'm sorry. The anything, the next one. Okay. Um, I was after our community meetings, um, if you pay attention also to the color palette we use, we derive the colors specifically, not just the Pan-African um, diaspora colors, but it was also the colors that was used for the Nelson Mandela mural that um, was demolished. I don't know when it was demolished, but I know it was in the area and that it was demolished and it was really an important piece to acknowledge um, for the area. So anything under the suns is a tribute to Malcolm X's le legacy. The quote that it was directly inspired by is simple. A man who believes in freedom will do anything under the sun to acquire or preserve this freedom. To constant strive to teach and lead Black people to freedom was arguably the largest message of his teachings. Malcolm X said what I just said. <laughs> freedom, financial, anatomical, spiritual, and creative is what many people constantly fight for and die for. Um, city parks, recreational centers, playgrounds, and especially basketball courts are where people really go to just taste a little bit of freedom. Like you pretend like you're Jordan, but that's your freedom to do that, to do so, you know, if it's accessible. Um, and so it's really beautiful, this activation, not only is it accessible, it's something that the community actively already uses. Um, so the figures bursting out from the court are reaching for and beyond the stars. They're also coming from the stars. So really it's to show like an infinite space of possibility, like, a field of dreams, if you will, which is also symbolic of a basketball court. So this is the design. Um, it was a collaborative effort. Um, I wanted to include all of the nuances from my team members' works along with my own work. I didn't want it to feel like it's one person that designed this thing. It was a collective effort. Um, it's gonna be, you know, a beautiful experience to, to work with these young women. And we're also encouraging other young people to just come, not just learn, but like we'll have them help us tape things off and maybe paint a few lines to really engage with them. Um, the prep will be um, a strong power washing because a piece only lasts as good as the prep work. <laughs> so we'll prep it properly. We'll get it et nice and etched, which will create, create a texture. Um, texturized thing in the concrete to, to make it accept the pigments better. We'll be using what a product called Crete is made by Benjamin Moore. It's literal concrete paint. You can get it in every pigment that a paint store has to offer. And it literally, the concrete literally absorbs this product. Um, so it's not like just sitting on top of it. 
So um, we'll we'll do that, and then we'll do a final uh, clear coat to protect protect the service and give it more longevity. And hopefully, in addition to that pr initial protection, like not only um, will it be damaged or less, um, you know, less chances of it being damaged, it will um, also hopefully just all you got to do is re clear coat it, even if it does start to to rub off a little bit. So that's what we have. And it should take about five to eight days to install um, sometime in the spring before his birthday. So that's our plan. Thanks so much, Sydney. Appreciate it and your presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up to commissioners for any comments or questions. Just a question, and Sydney and the whole team, thank you again for these presentations. So exciting to see these courts come to life. Um, the gray background of your design, would that be a painted gray, or is that just the color of the surface that you'd be working it'll be, on? It'll be the color of the court, because the court was just resurfaced, lines, and all of that. So it may even be a shade darker, which would make the uh, the colors pop even more. Got it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other commissioner questions? In that case, I'd like to open it up to any members of the public or if any of the artists on your team sitting here, here and would like to contribute as well. Happy to hear their thoughts. Are all of the artists using the same paint? Yes, baby. Okay. I was just asking in terms of like restoration, if it, like all, you know what I mean? If everybody was using the same process. It's, uh, all the same? Yes, it's all one thing. <laughs> one paint order, yep. No, I meant court to court, not you guys. I meant court to court. Oh. I knew you guys were, but I meant court to court because in terms of restoration, you know what I mean? When it comes time, is it is it like court A is going to need this kind of pain, or B is going to need this kind. That's more so what I was asking. So, so we're, um, you know, so we're time. actually, we have we haven't gotten to that piece just yet, but there we do plan to coordinate across the courts, um, because when all of our designs were created, they were created with commonalities in the color palette um, on purpose. So at some point there will be some dialogue between our team and the other two teams to get us all on the same page as far as paint that we'll be using and colors and all of that. Hi everybody, um, good afternoon. So first I just wanna say thank you so much to this team, I think what um, what this image symbolizes and the thought that you put behind it is just incredible and, and very exciting to see the final work. Um, I had a question that did come up in the planning and I was just wondering from you all as the experts, as the artists, do you have any concerns for the wear and tear that may happen over the years on the face? Um, no. Because I know the face is very detailed. Is that something the city needs to think about in the coming years of, of upkeep? Um, no, I don't think that should be an issue because again, we're using the concrete product. So like for that reason, but I really don't, I don't think it should be an issue at all. And it's not as, the faces aren't as detailed as it kind of looks on this small screen. Cause you gotta think how big, how large it's gonna be. And as opposed to like this, well, mine is a very like a thumbnail size. So it won't look as detailed as what you're seeing here because you know, it's going to be larger, but I don't, I don't have, it. I, I think with the proper prepping, the usage of the Crete, um, uh, the Crete, I don't even want to call it paint. I, it should be, yeah, yeah. The, the Crete, stain. Yeah, the Crete stain. Um, In addition to the, the, what, the clear coat that we want to put on top, Um, I think it should be safe. Especially if they do it, if they go over, if they cover the course at least once every year or once every couple of years too, just to kind of maintain it. 
I think it should be perfectly fine. Thanks for that question, Darsha. Well, now I'm curious if any commissioner would like to make a motion to approve final design of this court. I would like to make a motion to approve this final design. Thanks, James. Do I have a second? Second that. Great. Thanks, Diana. I'll call your name, commissioners, and please say yes if you agree with the motion. Diana? Yes. So excited so, to see women represented here. So <laughs> thank you. Brian? Yes. Nigel? Yes. James? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So congratulations, Sydney. Um, really you. excited to see this come together. We are too. We are so excited to be working alongside such dope artists on each court, both sides of the court too. It's going to really be a fun process. I'm excited. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, and guys. Our, our fifth presentation for review tonight is Give Them Their Flowers, a longtime asphalt mural in the final design phase by artist Rob Pro Black Gibbs and Michael Talbot for the Malcolm X Park Basketball Court in Roxbury, proposed by Liza Quinones. And Liza will introduce the final project for the evening. Um, I'm back once again, but last but not least, I'm thrilled to present the final long-term basketball court mural project at Malcolm X Park. Adorning court number one, Give Them Their Flowers, is the creative vision of Roxbury native artist, Dr. Rob Pro Black Gibbs and his team of exclusively native and local Boston artists. Together with the teams for court two and three, Rob and his team worked intently with the same community stakeholder group and considered additional input and engagement from the co-founder of the Roxbury Basketball Association. Additionally, all teams collaborated with each other to ensure that the designs across all three courts are not only consistent, but also complement each other, creating a cohesive and synergistic visual experience. I will now introduce Dr. Rob, Dr. Rob Pro Black Gibbs to take it away. Thanks a lot, Liza, and really appreciate that. Um, welcome to everybody on the chat. And I just want to say first off and give thanks for being a part of this very robust artistic team where um we're we're witnessing history happening in our neighborhood in the city. Um from the but we can get to the first slide and I'll jump right into it from the initial thoughts and interest. The beauty of the park and its history has a significance to just about everybody, including myself here. Um, it's a central and safe destination for a lot of folks in the neighborhood, especially you know the neighborhoods that have had a light in Roxbury. And at a time and a space where I shared with like my younger brother, it was the one thing that we had in common outside of the house, where like people watched us grow, played in leagues, and it was just one of the few places outside of the home where you know, it was a central landmark and a destination for everybody in Boston. So our initial artistic con uh, concept is to ensure that the cure, the court speaks to and celebrates the community of kings and queens surrounding the park. When thinking about important places on the map, we often say X marks the spot. So in this initial design, when you're talking about X marks the spot, they could be referring to a treasure or, or an important destination or even an undiscovered place. In the case of this court, Malcolm X Park marks the spot of one of Roxbury's greatest destinations. Um, talking about our team, that's just, you know, homegrown, proud to present uh, the likes of Ayanna Mack, where you'll probably know her work with the uh, open streets. You have uh, Lee Beard, who works closely with me on a lot of projects. Um, he's also one of the many members that worked on the Black Lives Matter piece. You have a, a, a native relative who's coming into the mix by the name of Michael Talbot, who's contributed to a large amount of uh, Roxbury murals that have happened over the past couple of years. Um, you have Mr. Ricardo Dean Five Gomez, the man behind the Roxbury love piece, will be on the court with us laying this down. And myself, Rob Pro Black Gibbs. Next slide, please. At this point, I can jump in. Everyone, uh, my name is Michael Talbot. 
Um, I'm part of uh, the team with Rob Probat Gibbs on this court. So I wanted to touch base on the story narrative that we had. Um, once we started working on the design, um, it was almost unanimous that uh, we all felt that this court needed to be more of a celebration rather than a memorial. And uh, the idea of giving people their flowers um, came to be, right? We wanted to highlight that, you know, um, the act of giving flowers is paying respect that's due and acknowledging um, the work and just people uh, over the years who have either gone unnoticed or who, have, who hasn't received the praise that they uh, deserve, right? Um, and that in addition to uh, the, the, the letter X as a, a, a design element, we wanted to, to highlight that as well. Um, as Rob mentioned, X marks a spot. It could be a destination, but it could also be a crossroads where different um, walks of life, different uh, avenues, different communities can come and meet together. So we wanted to highlight that with the design that we went with. Um, next slide. So this is essentially what we came up with, um, highlighting and um, emphasizing that X as the focal point. Um, when placed, uh, overlaid with the court, uh, we noticed that the, the, the X created um, two arrows as well as two pyramids, um, talking about the, the heritage and also like the, the direction that people will be um, going, like meeting in this central place and coming together. Um, but also we, we wanted to highlight the, the, the idea of giving people their flowers and um, the inclusion of uh, three specific um, species of flowers and their symbolism within this court. Uh, we wanted to kind of paint the picture of uh, providing this bouquet for people of the community, um, as well as honoring and celebrating the memory of, you know, uh, Malcolm X. And as you can see, a bird's eye view of the courts and how they uh, complement each other. And you're seeing it in play where we are imaging the, the Pan-African colorway on the trim of our court. All courts complementing and, and speaking to each other in a way with the, um, the visual language and color palette is trans transferring across each court. Next slide. And in the spirit of the game and how it's ran, we broke down our installation plan into four quarters knowing that in each quarter of the game, we're gonna give all the preparation, the time it deserves so that we can um, plan and execute well and one step won't happen without the next. This is just a full de de detailed laid out installation plan that we can possibly pass on for touch-ups and things of that nature and to just kind of keep ourselves in line. Next slide. And uh, hopping in right here, um, we, paid really close attention to the selection of materials used that will be used um, in executing this mural. Um, and for each each material, each uh, piece of equipment, we ensured that it was like, it took into consideration longevity, but also like quality of um, like bringing everything uh, that we wanted to represent forward. Um, in terms of the maintenance plan, uh, we'll be providing a, a, a list of these materials. Um, again, we'll be talking with the other teams as well to get a, a, a more common list that everybody can, can a more common list that will be uh, common across each court and uh, providing this so that repairs can be made uh, by either our artists or future conservators over the next five years. Next slide. The community engagement plan is an exciting part of our of our installation because um as we're painting the courts and everybody rightfully so will have some level of uh attention that comes when this is happening because this is such a historic thing. We wanted to take the um take in consideration the feedback that we got from stakeholders in the community and our efforts in delivering this bouquet 
with the title of an initiative that we called Hoops and You. Um, we wanted to take the time to, you know, make commemorative pieces that we are gifting to, to community members that are going to be coming while we're painting the court, talking to them and engaging in them. And the goal is to give away 51 basketballs, which um, honors the 51 years that um, that activity in the court has started since the Roxbury Basketball Association has started back in 73. So the idea is to um, customize basketball courts with a, or not basketball courts, but customize along with the basketball court basketballs that um, people will walk away with the commemorative piece, gifting the last ball to Shelbourne with the signatures from all the artists involved. This is a very historic moment that we wanted to captivate, um, taking into consideration like, you know, the, the wave of the um, hashtag use and such. We wanted to bring that into play as well. But um, in conclusion, I wanted to kind of let Mike say something before we time to wrap this up. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, the aim again was to not overcomplicate the, the, the court, but to celebrate the, the simplicity of the design that will, you know, not, not distract the players while they're on the court. So it's, there's no question as to what they're going to be doing while they're there. Um, we still want it to look good. We still want it to serve that purpose. But um, again, this is still as a, a celebration yet, you know, allowing it, the court itself to be functioning. And on top of its function, you know, what the park has uh, forged and contributed to the community over the years, you know, our younger brothers, sisters, sons, sons and daughters will no longer know it as its, you know, its formal identity, but will identify it as Malcolm X Park, which contributes to the future. And I feel like um, with the contributions of, of everybody that came before and just knowing that folks are standing on the shoulders of giants, this is going to be something that is going to definitely celebrate a lot in one city. So I want to thank everybody for giving us the time to just listen to what we're about to do. And um, thank you, Growing Floor. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Michael. Um, I particularly like the Hoops and Jews initiative, and I hope that as you give those basketballs away, you see some of them return to the court and are used in games that people are playing. So I think that's a great addition. Um, I now open it up to commissioners for questions and comments. I just want to make a comment. Um, I think if you can go back to the image where you see all the courts together, um, it's really interesting to sort of see this as an overall composition. Um, and I guess one of the questions I do have is that it, it does seem here, right, that you're painting also outside of the bounds of the court, which I think is a little bit different, right, than the rest of the other schemes, or maybe I'm seeing an optical illusion here, but could you clarify that if possible? Yeah, the court is uh, physically bigger than the others. And mm -hmm. I want to say in the in the modification of us putting the trim around the court, there are going to be things that um help the push and pull of the design. You are seeing the larger court because it's a, it's a larger like footprint in that, you know, that championship court that's on the top, which is court one. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Any other commissioners? The court on the left, is that, talk to me about the court on the left that we're seeing. The the last court, mm -hmm. if you're going from right to left. So that is, um, that is court number four. And with the park renovation project, that was a court that was dedicated to um, a program called Math Talks. Um, this is not a project that went through um, arts and culture. It was something that went through the parks department um, mm. and their commitment to creating a court through um, Math Talks that uh, promoted the engagement of the youngest players who play on that court and their ability to incorporate math um, counting and um, numerical elements 
um, as a learning experience through basketball on that court. Got it. Okay. Thank you. I'd now like you to, to open it up to any members of the public who'd like to either ask a question or make a comment. I'd, I'd, I'd like to add that uh, I guess the fourth court, it's not really into the X marks the spot, it's to the, the, the court uh, totally opposite. I actually like that there is um, trees and, and green and, and, and water there during the development of uh, Malcolm X Park, uh, about 65 trees were cut down, 65 elder trees were cut down. And I think that it's wonderful that there's something there that is actually reflecting upon the, the green program of the, of the mayor of the city to save trees and to create green space. And although Roxbury isn't one of the largest communities, isn't the largest community in Boston, Dorchester is, Roxbury is one of the most densely um, uh, populated areas. And so that when we talk about green space and the need for trees and the need for water, I like that there's a court that actually has uh, pieces in it that actually reflect that. And it's also, I think, another piece where parents and community members can talk about the need for trees and the need for fresh air and the need for, uh, places like, you know, um, what they call heat zones or heat islands not to occur. So it, I think it's a wonderful educational piece. And I think it ties these these pieces together very well. So that's what I wanted to add. Um, I love X marks the spot and I just love this whole thing. So just as a community member, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to see this all and I'm gonna be quiet now, but thank you. No, thanks so much for your comment, Ford. Any other members of the public? I just have a quick question. Sure, Smoke. Um, they, and I don't know if this is an arts thing or a parks thing, but the two, court number two and what is it? I guess not, 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 uh, the two middle courts we're calling. Um, the lines as it pertains to the free flow line, the box, like the paint area, those are different on, on the two different courts. And so the lines need to be the same on all the courts. You know what I mean? Because th that, those are regulation lines. I'm talking about the white lines, nothing to do with the art. I'm just talking about the actual regulatory lines that you play with. That's a The big... lines are already painted. So whatever yeah. they are now is what would be there. Because I think every plan for every team is just to take those off. So mm -hmm. they'll be the same. Yeah. Well, but this, this is my point though, right? So I, that's why I said I don't know if it's a thing necessarily with the artist, but it's I feel like if this is the only time that I'm gonna that it's gonna come up, or that I'm gonna be able to voice it to whoever is in charge, whoever that may be or have say so, it's something that I'll point out that people it's already something people are like, hey, these lines aren't it because they're not the same on two courts that are the exact same size. So well, some, that's because there is no image of the actual court, so we were just pulling from online like basketball court this size and that's what we was using but the courts that you're looking at now like if you're looking at court what was that three and two mine and um and the uh, the, the other group that's a literal screenshot of an actual sky view of your actual court so yeah, I, I understand that i, I go to, I, i'm at the courts often so my point is that the two in the middle if nothing else, whether it's a, whether it's it's I don't think it's an artist thing, right? Even if it's before the artists come out and do the work, if it's a city thing, those white lines have to be the same on both courts. Is all I'm saying. I don't. So know they are. I share this with Lauren. We um. That makes sense. We've been talking about we've been talking to Lauren about some other um, questions about the court. Like we asked her to look into how water was collecting on it. We've been following up on some other things, so we can add this to that conversation. And Smoke, can I just have a follow-up question? Are you saying that as the lines currently exist now, they're different? What I'm saying is that if you just, based on what I'm seeing on screen, right, if this is a screenshot of that, if you look to the what they call the key, like outside the paint, right, you'll notice that the boxes and the hashtags on the side of those are different. You know what I mean? They're not mm -hmm. to court. That's what I'm referring to. 
So okay. I'm not sure if the other measurements are the like are the are the same. Like it looks like on the the green court, right? Uh, or excuse me, on we'll call it court number two, at the three point line closer to the corner, it's more like an elbow shape. Like there's there's mm -hmm. actually this kind of corner on court number three. It looks completely curved and completely smooth. As you you see what I'm saying. So those subtleties are what I'm referring to in terms of the consistency among the courts. I don't know who that's, whose thing that is, but it was just something that I was pointing out. That's all. No, and again, sort of, it is consistent. I'm sure he probably did that digitally, which is why it looks like that, because it's a digital sketch. But the actual lines that are already painted are the actual lines that would be there that we are using. Gotcha. Yeah, just if I can jump in, um, all of the lines that are present in terms of the the actual playing lines um, were confirmed by Lauren to be all regulatory standard lines. Um, and so in, in the artist's process, they'll just be taping and tracing with tape over those lines to protect them. Um, from the actual painting process. So then when they remove the tape, those regulatory lines will still um, be consistent. Let's smoke a good comment to bring up. Well, now, if I may, I would like to make a motion to approve giving them flowers at Malcolm X Park basketball court in Roxbury. And I'm curious if any commissioner has a second. I'll second that. Thanks, Diana. After I state your name, commissioner, please say yes if you approve the motion. Diana? Yes. Brian? Enthusiastic, yes. Nigel? Yes. James? Yes, indeed. And I'm a yes as well, so the motion passes. Rob Michael, congratulations. Excited to see this realized um, on the basketball court. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Deeply appreciate it. <laughs> so now our final order of business is a motion to adjourn. Um, but before that, I would like to remind commissioners of the special BAC meeting we have on March 26th. Um, is that the correct date? I believe so, at 4.30? Yes. Perfect. So just a reminder to that and to members of the public who are here, we'll be reviewing some additional projects. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that. And now would any commissioner like to make a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting? Oh, come on, jump in, y'all. Yeah, we just don't want to, no, I'll make that motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thanks, James. You just don't want it to end, right? <laughs> Do I have a second? I'll okay. second that. <laughs> Thanks, Diana. Commissioners, I'll call your name. Please say yes if you agree to the motion. Diana? Yes. Brian? Yes. Nigel? Yes. James? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the meeting is adjourned. Thanks, commissioners. Thanks to all members of the public. And of course, thanks to the artists who are here today. See you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good night, y'all. Good night.